Hey everybody and welcome to our second video lecture in our course on group schemes. Today what we're going to be talking about are the first, second, and third isomorphism theorems from group theory, but in the context of affine group schemes. To start out, let's recap what those theorems say, but just for abstract groups. The first isomorphism theorem talks about a homomorphism between two groups, G and H. The first statement is that the kernel of the homomorphism, phi, is a normal subgroup of G. Secondly, the image of phi is a, normal, uh, is a subgroup of H, not necessarily normal. And finally, it says that the image of phi is going to be isomorphic to the quotient of the group G by a normal subgroup given by the kernel of phi. For the second isomorphism theorem, I start out with a group, a subgroup S of G, and a normal subgroup H of G. In this case, the product Sn is a subgroup of G. The intersection S intersect N is a normal subgroup of S. And finally, the quotient of S by this normal subgroup is isomorphic to Sn mod N. One nice example application of the second isomorphism theorem is that the GCD of two natural numbers is equal to the product of those natural numbers divided by the least common multiple. To see this, take G to be the group of integers, H to be the subgroup consisting of integers divisible by A, oh, and we have a typo, don't we? In my statement here, uh, H should have been an all normal subgroup. And I'm going to take S to be AZ. And I'm going to take N to be BZ. Notice that G is a billion, so N is automatically a normal subgroup. In this case, S intersect N consists of all the integers which are divisible by both A and B. So this is the least common multiple of A and B times the group Z. That is to say, all integers which are divisible by the least common multiple of A and B. The product group in this case, which we write as a sum because my group is, has a group multiplication given by addition, has S plus N given by all those integers which are divisible by the GCD of A B, A and B. So the second isomorphism theorem tells us then that AZ mod the least common multiple of ABZ is isomorphic to the GCD of ABZ mod BZ. The group on the right has order equal to A mod the least common multiple of AB, and the group on the left has order equal to the GCD of AB mod B. So those two orders have to be the same, and our application statement follows immediately. The third isomorphism talks about a group G with a normal subgroup N. To begin, it says that there's a bijective correspondence between subgroups of the quotient G mod N and subgroups of G containing N. This correspondent, in particular, sends a subgroup K of G containing N to the quotient group K mod N. The second part of the theorem says that this correspondence preserves normality. So if K is a normal subgroup of G containing N, then K mod N is going to be a normal subgroup of G mod N. Conversely, every normal subgroup of G mod N is of the form K mod N for some normal subgroup of G containing N. The final part of the third isomorphism theorem says that if I have a normal subgroup K of G containing N, then the quotient group G mod N mod K mod N is isomorphic to G mod K. And this is also often thought of as just being able to cancel the ends in the quotient representation. Now what we'd like to do is prove these three isomorphism theorems in the context of affine group schemes. Of course, one of the main things we'll need is the existence of quotients to begin with. In the last lecture, we defined what it means for our map to be a quotient map, but we have not as yet proved that given a normal subgroup of a group G, the quotient G mod N exists as an affine group scheme. That's, of course, the content of the following proposition. We start out with an affine group G with normal subgroup N, and the statement is that there exists a quotient map G to Q for some affine group Q with kernel N satisfying a universal property. Given any, given any morphism from G to H, which factors through the, which, which would, when restricted to the normal subgroup, factors through the co-identity, or which equivalently sends everything in that normal subgroup to the identity, or put a third way, which has N in its kernel, will then necessarily have a map from Q to H, which is unique and makes the corresponding diagram unique. The 
The affine group scheme Q is determined uniquely up to isomorphism and is called the quotient of G by N. For convenience, we often denote this as G mod N. So this is how we define the quotient of G. It's via this universal property. To prove this, let's consider the collection of all morphisms from G to H whose kernels contain N. I'll go ahead and call that set lambda. Specifically, it consists of all tuples HF, where H is some affine group, and F is an af a homomorphism of affine groups from G to H, whose kernel contains N. Given the finite collection of such tuples, say sigma, I define N sub sigma to be the intersection of the kernels of the corresponding morphisms. The corresponding map, uh, sorry, the corresponding affine group is a subgroup of G, and therefore has a coordinate ring determined by a quotient of OG. In particular, we can write that the coordinate ring of n sub sigma is going to be isomorphic to the coordinate ring of g mod some ideal, which I'll denote as i sub sigma. And if I look at some sigma prime, which contains sigma, then containment is reversed for the associated subgroups, and consequently, the ideal i sigma is contained in the ideal of i sigma prime. Where here we want to remember that I sigma specifically is some ideal of OG. Now if we use the Noetherian condition on OG, this means that I have the ascending chain condition on ideal. So at some point my ideals have to stop growing and I have to have a largest one. That is, specifically there exists some subset omega of lambda which is finite so that any other finite subset has an ideal which is contained in the ideal i omega. I claim that the corresponding family has our desired universal property. Specifically, if I take q to be, I define q to be the product over i of the hi's, where here omega is the set of tuples fi hi, and I consider the natural map q going from g to q defined by sending an element g of gr to the n-tuple consisting of fig's inside the project, a product of hir for any k-algebra r. Note in particular that the kernel of q is the intersection over i of the kernels of the fi's. Therefore, if I have any map G to H between affine group schemes, such that the kernel of F contains N. By maximality, I know that N sub omega equals N sub omega union the singleton consisting of the tuple FH, which is precisely N sub omega intersected in the kernel of F. So what this means is that the kernel of f must contain n sub omega, which is precisely the kernel of q. And by a result that we proved last time, this means that there's a map going from q to h, making the associated triangle commute. So this proves the existence of a group scheme satisfying this property of being a quotient, this sort of universal property. What we haven't shown, though, is that the associated kernel is actually given by n, and this is a bit trickier. So let's talk about that a little bit further. Is the kernel n omega that we derive actually equal to n? This is a reasonable question to ask. and the uh, the answer is yes, if and only if there exists a homomorphism of group schemes whose kernel is n. This is something that we can prove in the case where k is a field specifically by considering the representation theory over various field extensions of the base field. However, this is in general not the case. We'll have the tools to prove this later on when we discuss the representation theory of affine group schemes. But for now, we'll just declare victory.
it's worth pointing out here that we're very carefully skirting the issue of actually trying to give an explicit definition for the sheath defining the quotient. In particular, the intuitive definition of the quotient of two affine group schemes turns out to be incorrect. If I started out with a group, G, with a normal subgroup, N, and I wanted to define G mod N, I would naturally want to consider the functor from K algebras to sets, which takes a K algebra R and sends it to the quotient group GR mod NR. The problem with this is that the functor is typically not representable. As an example of this, consider the affine subgroup U2 of the affine group GM. Then for any ring R, U2 of R is just the set of all R and R so that R squared is 1. GM of R is the collection of all on R and R such that R is a unit. So this puts all together. FR is the collection of equivalence classes of units in R, where R is equivalent to S if and only if R squared equals S squared. However, the actual quotient in this situation is much simpler. In particular, we have a short exact sequence of group schemes. U2 to GM to GM to 1, where in the middle the group homomorphism is given by sending an element G to G squared. And what can show that this is a quotient map and that this is the corresponding kernel? So in this case, GM mod mu2 is actually again GM. The sequence here is called the Kummer sequence. And this is just one example showing that the definition of the quotient is a little bit more subtle than you might expect. The real idea here is we look at the functor f that we just defined as being something like a pre-sheaf, and we sheafify it into what we'll later call a sheaf over the flat topology. The ingredients are our group G another group H, and a morphism between the two. We've spent a bunch of time trying to define what we mean by quotients, but we haven't spent any time yet thinking about what we mean by the image of a morphism of group schemes. To define the image, remember that a morphism of group schemes induces a, a morphism of the corresponding coordinate rings. So given a morphism from G to H, we have an associated morphism which goes from OH OG, which I'm going to denote by phi. And this is a morphism of Hopf algebras. In particular, its kernel will be a Hopf ideal. This means that OH mod the kernel of phi is going to be the coordinate ring of a certain subgroup. of H. In particular, the map from G to H then factors as, well, let's say it this way, the map from OH to OG will necessarily factor through this kernel. And on the scheme theoretic side, the arrows are reversing, and this is giving us a map going 
from g into h prime, which is factoring our original map f. We call h prime the image of f. Note that the map from OH mod kernel of B, which is OH prime, into OG is injected. Since these are all group schemes, this forces the map from G to H prime to be a projection map, or sorry, a quotient map. And of course, the latter map is an inclusion which in particular is injective. So with all that being said, we can now state our first isomorphism theorem. If I think back to the original iso first isomorphism theorem, it said that I want the kernel to be a normal subgroup. That's something that we know already from previous lectures. I want the image to be a subgroup. That's very clear from the definition we just gave. And then I want the image to be isomorphic to the original group mod its kernel. So that's really the part that we want to prove here. So the theorem we want to prove is that for a morphism of group schemes, G mod the kernel of the morphism is isomorphic to the image of the morphism. So let's try to prove this. Remember starting out that I can factor my map from G to H as G to h prime to h, where here, this in particular, is going to be a quotient map. And this factors my original map, f, going from g to h. So in particular, this quotient map has a kernel, which is exactly the kernel of the original map, f. From the universal property of quotients, this means that I can factor my map from g to h prime through g mod the kernel of f. Furthermore, the map from g to h prime is a quotient map, and the map from g to g mod the kernel of f is some map whose kernel contains the kernel of f because it is it, so I know as well that I have a unique map going the other way. Just because the map from g to h prime is also a quotient map. So I have two maps going, both going in the same direction, going in opposite directions, both making the corresponding triangle commute, and they're unique. So this forces this map from g mod the kernel of f into h prime to be a unique isomorphism.
Next, let's consider the second isomorphism theorem. We've established already in previous lectures that the intersection of two affine group schemes is also an affine group scheme. And it's an easy exercise to verify that if n is normal, then s intersect n will be normal in s. The associated argument basically follows your nose with the same argument in the classical case. More interesting is the first statement that s times n is a subgroup of g. This is because we need to figure out an appropriate definition of s times n in the group scheme case. In particular, for group schemes, the functor sn evaluated at a k-algebra r is not necessarily the product of sr and nr. For example, one can show that gln is the product of sln and gm, but glnr is not the product of slnr times gmr. In particular, not every matrix in glnr can be written as the product of a matrix or which is determinant 1 times some scalar value. This is because nth roots of unity in the ring R don't need to necessarily exist. Put another way, the functor from k-algebra is the sets, which takes a, a ring R and sends it to nrsr, is not necessarily representable. So our question here is, how should we define SN? And the thing that I want to remember is that an arbitrary intersection of subgroups of an affine group scheme will also be an affine group scheme. This leads us to the following very intuitive definition. That SN is going to be the intersection of all subgroups H of G, such that HR contains SR and R for all R. And as we already noted, this will automatically be a group scheme. Alternatively, we can think about Sn the sh is, uh, as the sheafification of the functor that we defined intuitively above. We'll talk more about this process of sheafification later, but as you can already tell, it's a pretty important construction because it allows us to take our intuitive definitions and extend those definitions to an appropriate generalization, which still has the geometry intact. But going back to the second isomorphism theorem, since G is a group that's contained in G and contains SR and R, the fact that SN is a subgroup of G is very clear from the definition. So at this point, to prove the second isomorphism theorem, the only thing we really need to show is property C. So with this in mind, let's try to prove the second isomorphism theorem for affine group schemes. In this statement, I'm letting S and N be subgroups of an affine group G with N normal, and I'm just claiming that the usual identity that we get from the second isomorphism theorem for abstract groups still holds. The proof of this starts out by using the second isomorphism theorem for abstract groups. That tells us that SR mod SR intersect NR will be isomorphic to SR NR mod NR. In particular, these two functors agree, both the functor taking an R and sending it to SR mod SR intersect NR, and the functor taking an R and sending it to SR NR mod NR. These functors are not representable but the sheafifications of these functors, again, this is a construction that we'll talk about later, are representable. And since these two functors are isomorphic, their sheafifications are isomorphic. And these sheafifications are given by S mod N R, or S mod S intersect N, the quotient, and S N mod N. So because those functors agree, their sheafifications, which are these functors that we're considering in the first place, must also agree. And that is how the proof goes. For the third isomorphism theorem, we need to establish a correspondence between subgroups of the quotient g mod n and subgroups containing n. We need to further show that this correspondence preserves normality and, of course, prove the classical result that you can cancel the n's. To prove this, Let's first remember that 
the coordinate ring of n is isomorphic to the coordinate ring of g mod some ideal i. This means that we can identify the collection of subgroups of g containing n with top ideals of the coordinate ring OG of g containing i. Sorry, there's a typo there, contained in i. And now if we use the same third isomorphism theorem for rings, I see that if I have an ideal j contained in i, then OG mod J is going to be isomorphic to OG mod J mod I mod J, and this further establishes a bijective correspondence with subgroups of G mod N. The fact that these correspondences preserve normality is very easy to check. And then finally for C, we again want to use the classical fact that if N is a subgroup of K, and both N and K are normal in G, then GR mod NR modulo KR mod NR is going to be isomorphic to GR mod KR. This means that, again, that the two functors, sending R to GR mod N mod KR, or alternatively sending R to GR mod NR mod KR mod NR, are going to be is uh, isomorphic. This implies that their sheafifications will be isomorphic. And the sheafifications will be the group schemes G mod N mod k mod n and g mod k. So this again illustrates the importance of the sheafification operation. That's all for now. I'll see you guys next time.